Good evening. Um, Yuval Noah Harari received his PhD from the University of Oxford. He's currently a lecturer at the Department of History, the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. And his book, Sapiens, A Brief History of Humankind, has sold over 8 million copies and been translated into nearly 50 languages. It's been recommended by your friend, my friend, and Barack Obama, and Bill Gates, and Mark Zuckerberg. Um, it happens to currently be, now the book came out in 2014 in the US. It is currently the number one selling paperback on both the LA Times uh, bestseller and the New York Times bestseller list, which I think that's remarkable. <laughs> His next one, Homo Deus, A Brief History of Tomorrow, has sold over four million. And a review by Bill Gates of his latest book, 20 le 21 Lessons for the 21st Century, uh, was the cover uh, review in the New York Times uh, Review of Books yesterday. Um, Yuval? Uh, We've had the pleasure of getting a little time together out there, which is nice. That doesn't always happen. Um, I like folks to get a feel for the person, mm -hmm. beyond the work, the ideas, the book. So can you tell us in your own words a bit about your path, how you see yourself becoming who you are and the work you're doing today? Uh, feel free to mention mentors, turning points, that kind of Ooh, thing. Uh, that can take a long time. <laughs> to be brief, I, I would say that I, I'm, I think I'm very lucky that I can just pursue the questions that really, really interest me, uh, that interested me maybe all my life. And you know, I, I really uh, realize how, how lucky it is that, that this is what I can do for a living, and um, even have ad other in people interested in, 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 in my findings, in my answers, in my questions. Um, it, it, it was a very surprising route. I mean, if you told me like 10 years ago, even six years ago, what you just said, <laughs> I would have, this is completely impossible. And um, it, it happened, as things do. I mean, most, one of the things I do know about history as a historian, both the history of the whole of humankind and the history of individuals, is how incredibly accidental it tends to be. Yes that you, know, you have a, f a few things in history which are deterministic, but they, are, uh, they, they tend to be few. Some of the biggest events and developments are completely accidental. Uh, whether you think about the rise of Christianity or the communist revolution in Russia a century ago, these are extremely unlikely events. If you took the film of history and pressed the rewind button and played it again, and did it a hundred times, I don't think that Chris, anybody would have known what is Christianity more than twice out of these hundred times, and the same with Lenin. Um, and I guess the same with my life. Equally momentous. If you rewind the movie of the last 10 years of, of, of my life and, and press play again, then in most cases, I guess I would still be some history professor specializing in medieval military history in the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, and nobody would have heard of me. And also, I, I know that a lot of the credit for the success of the book, I mean, lots of people, even if I wrote the book, lots of people write good books, which nobody ever heard of. And uh, without the support of, of my team, and especially of my husband, who is also my manager, I don't think that many people would have heard of me. So it's, it's, it's good to be, uh, I think, realistic about yes. these things. Yes. Now, when you set out to write Sapiens, which was a departure for you, as you said, you were, you were in more of a niche before that. Um, did you, at what point in that process did you say, this is not an academic book, this is a book for the public? Oh, when I wrote Sapiens from the very beginning, it was a book for, for the public. But when I wrote it, I thought the public meant uh, <laughs> college students and maybe high school students in Israel. Uh, that's about it. I wrote it in, in, <laughs> I wrote it in Hebrew. It took like uh, two or three years to find an English publisher who was willing to, uh, to take it up. 
Um, so yeah, I, 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 part of I think part of the success of the book is also because. I felt extremely free when I wrote it. That's right. Because I didn't think that many people would actually write it. <laughs> so who cares, you know? <laughs> right. In other words, I mean, and I, I, and I see that. In other words, the ambition mm -hmm. was in some ways uh, inversely proportional to who you think would, would read it. Yeah. I mean, if, 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 if you think that, you know, all these famous people and people all over the world and physicists and biology, like I had the um, temerity, the chutzpah, Oh, to fun. write about evolution, about, about economics. Like, I still sometimes kind of take a peek at the chapter on capitalism. And I think, oh no, oh. now all these economists are reading this. And <laughs> <laughs> now what, but that trick, you couldn't trick yourself on the second book. No. With the second book, it was the opposite trick. By then, I was like so successful, and who cares, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Uh, let's see. There's a quote. When I went mm -hmm. to your homepage, there's a quote. History began when humans invented gods, and it will end when humans become gods. Yeah. Now, you chose to put that boom right at the top. What does that mean to you? Well, that's the best summer of history in one sentence that I could come up with. Um, history began when humans invented gods, in the sense that what makes us the dominant species on Earth is our ability to cooperate in large numbers. And what makes it possible for us to cooperate in large numbers is the ability to invent stories yes. and spread them around and make millions of people believe in them. And stories about gods were, for thousands of years, some of the most efficient stories in getting people to cooperate. Um, and this is our huge advantage over the chimpanzees and was over the Neanderthals and all the other competition, that we can invent these fictions and the chimpanzees can't. And this is why we can cooperate in millions and the chimpanzees can't cooperate in more than a few dozen. And then the, the second part yeah. is that uh, an history ends when we become gods. We are very close to the point when we are literally gods. I mean, I don't mean that as some kind of flowery metaphor, but in the most literal sense, if you think about the abilities that most mythologies ascribed to gods for thousands for, of years, then we are in the process of acquiring these abilities to ourselves especially the abilities to, to create, to create life. And all the things, we, 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 all the stories we told about Zeus or about Vishnu or about Yahweh, we are now on the verge of realizing them ourselves. And when this happens, uh, this is no longer human beings and this is no longer history. It's something, it's still something, yeah. It's not the apocalypse, it's not the end of the world, it's just something that goes completely beyond our imagination and completely beyond the logic of history as we have known it for the last 70,000 years. So it, history ends because there's such a disconnect with previous history? I mean, stories, the story, a story will continue to I unfold, don't know. I perhaps. mean, once, once you go beyond that point, by definition, you as a human being, as a homo sapiens, or I as a homo sapiens, cannot imagine what is the next station. Uh, if I can imagine, it means it's, it's not the next station. It's still the same thing. It's a bit like, like to take an, an analogous case, try to explain to a Neanderthal how Wall Street works. <laughs> now, <laughs> you can't. I mean, it's just absolutely impossible. Well, a lot he, more folks than Neanderthals can't understand how Wall no, Street works. <laughs> I, 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 on, on purpose, I took yes. a complicated yes. example. Yes. Oh, com actually, a simple example. It's obvious you can't explain it. Yeah. So this, this is why Neanderthals are, are different from us. And whatever replaces us, it will be different from us much more than we are different from Neanderthals. Ah. We are still very much like Neanderthals. There are, still, there are tiny differences. But if you look at our bodies, at our brains, at our basic emotional abilities, at our social relations, we are still apes. 
We are still very similar to Neanderthals, to chimpanzees, and all our, the rest of our cousins. But whatever replaces Homo sapiens, when we really master the new abilities of uh, re-engineering life, either on an on a organic basis, with genetic engineering and things like that, or on an inorganic basis, right. whatever replaces us, it will be much, much more different. Uh, in the sense that, for example, just to give one example, I mean, we and chimpanzees and also elephants and porcupines and whatever other animal you, you, you care to think about, um, in order to, to be, in order to exist and to function, we have to be in the same place at the same time. All the parts of our body mm. needs to be here now for them to function. I, if you separate my hands and, and legs from my body, they don't work anymore. And I probably don't, don't work anymore. But if, for example, we solve the problem, and there are many people working on that, and we are making very fast progress on the problem of directly connecting brains to computers, and therefore also brains to all kinds of bionic parts, uh, you can have non-organic uh, limbs and non-organic body parts which are disconnected from your body and they are still functioning. If I have a bionic hand, to take, to take the simplest example, the example like everybody gives it uh, in this context, if I have a bionic hand connected to my brain through a direct brain-computer interface, this hand doesn't need to be attached to my body. It can be in a different room, a different city, a different continent, a different planet. It all depends on how fast the connection you have. But in principle, I mean, the, the, the idea which held for millions of years of evolution, all the parts of your body must be here now, <laughs> that this is no longer the case. Yeah. And this is just one small, simple example of the kind of differences we are looking at. Yeah, so it's that, it's that break in biology to some extent that really yeah, it, it's the break in, in the in the basic rules of the game of life we have two systems of rules that governed life for four billion years right. you have organic biochemistry and you have natural selection and we are breaking both sets of rules at the same time we are replacing natural selection with intelligent design and we are breaking out of the realm of organic biochemistry and starting to engineer and manufacture non-organic life. So it's not just a break with the Neanderthals. It's not just a break with the chimpanzees. It's also a break with the dinosaurs. It's, it's a break with the amoebas. It's a break with everything that lived on Earth for four billion years. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me jump to the present. Yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> another quote. If somebody describes to you the world of the mid 21st century and it sounds like science fiction, it's probably false. But then if somebody describes to you the world of the 21st century and it doesn't sound like science fiction, it is certainly false. Um, what that means to you? Uh, it's actually not, not my quote. I took it from somebody. I don't remember whom. I read it somewhere, and it was a very good quote. Um, it means that, on the one hand, it's almost impossible to envision the future, say, of 2050. And this is really the first time in history when we have no ability to envision the future of just 30 years from now. Yeah. We can't, nobody really knows what the job market would look like, what the political system would look like, uh, even to some extent what human relations would look like, things like gender identity, things like family structure, things like just how you relate to other people. These were the constants of history. If you go back, say, a thousand years, yes, there are many things. If you live, say, in England in 1018, there are many, many things you don't know about England or Europe of 1050. You know, the Vikings might invade, the Mongols <laughs> might invade, there might be a huge epidemic, a third of the population might die, all kinds of civil wars, whatever. But all this doesn't really change the fundamentals of societies. When you look in 1018 towards the year 1050, you still envision that in 1050, most people will be peasants. 
humanity will probably still divide itself into men and women, and men will probably dominate women. Uh, politics, it can go in all kinds of ways, but most probably you will still have a king and an aristocracy. Maybe a different dynasty, maybe a different origin, but you don't envision things like the dictatorship of the proletariat. It's not going to happen <laughs> by 1050. Um, so you have some, of, some uncertainties, but most of the basic foundations of societies, and certainly the human body, things like life expectancy, this is not going to change. Now when we look to 2050, we have no idea. Um, so most of the forecasts are going to turn out to be false. Uh, and I also say it about my forecast, I, I'm not, I definitely not a prophet, I have no idea how it would look like. The only thing I can say for certain, it will be very different from now. I try to map different possibilities, largely in the hope of avoiding the worst possibilities. It's a bit like, you know, like in sorcery, that if you are able to, f to, to say the name of somebody, you have power over him, over it, whatever. So like that, I, I have maybe this infantile idea <laughs> that if I can name the most dangerous possibilities just by bringing attention and awareness to these possibilities, I can prevent them or I can help prevent them from happening. Maybe yes, maybe no. But we have no idea how it would look like. The only thing we can be certain about that it will look like science fiction because it will be dramatically different from the world of today. Actually, I, I, I just had a converse, very interesting conversation about it l last night. Most science fiction is probably uh, lacking in imagination to really envision the world of the mid to late 21st century. And this, this maybe is not really the fault mm -hmm. of, of science, fic science fiction author. It's also just a, a matter of marketing that if you created a realistic movie about the world, say, of 2100, you would have very few people watching it today because most people will not be able to understand what they are seeing and will certainly not be able to relate to the characters and to their, uh, uh, and to their d dilemmas and, and conflicts and so forth, just as like Neanderthals will not find a lot of interest in most of our artistic creations. Now, one thing you said there, I, you know, I'm nodding and I'm going, and then, wait, while <laughs> I don't assume mm -hmm. that there is, you know, a, a universal, unchangeable truth that is going to guide us through these changes. It does still seem comfortable to me mm -hmm. to imagine that there are certain things about the way we work that may But, but these are the things we will be able to start changing, exactly these things. This is like the biggest change. The biggest change will not be in the world outside. Out the biggest changes will be in the new abilities to change the body and the brain. So, you know, change the, the, the world outside, we have been doing it for thousands of years. We are, you know, cutting down forests or building cities of domesticated animals or building new socioeconomic systems. This has been done and, and will continue to do this, right. of course. But the, real, the really big changes will now be in humanity itself which haven't changed much for thousands That's of right. years. That's right. I mean, if you look back, say, to biblical times, or even to the Stone Age, we are still the same humans. But if you look forward a century or two ago, this will be the, the biggest change. And this is where, again, science fiction has its, its greatest problems, because if you looked at something like, I don't know, Star Trek, so, yes, they have all these spaceships flying at the speed of light, and laser guns, and photon torpedoes, and whatnot, but the humans are exactly the same. <laughs> the I mean, same foibles, the they, same urges. They, are, they, are just, they took these suburban Americans and stuck <laughs> them in, in a spaceship. <laughs> but, you know, even if you look back in history, you would find, you know, the Mongols or whatever, they are far more strange than the people in Star Trek. So, um, and, and, and of course, if you will be realistic and try to really envision 
what kind of beings will exist. What year is Star Trek? Like 2200 something? Uh, nobody would watch it because nobody right. could understand it. Right. Oh, wow. Um, I want to take one step back yeah? and just talk about the process of this book, uh, which is you say that this book was written in conversation with the public. And so we'll, we'll get back into the meat of it. But yeah. how did that work for you? Because I assume the first two were not. The first two were, were written in conversation with a far more limited public. Yes. Like my student in, in university. So I, I always had conversation with them. And even a silent conversation, like I say something and everybody like falls asleep, it means it's, it's boring <laughs> and, and it, it shouldn't be in, probably shouldn't be in the book. <laughs> but uh, 21 Lessons was a much more uh, uh, lively conversation in the sense that it, it really reflects the kind of questions I was asked after I published uh, uh, Sapiens and Homo Deus. So I, I had these kinds of interviews, and I wrote pieces for all kinds of, of newspapers, and I was uh, I getting a lot of emails from people. So the questions that people asked me and the, the influenced the kind of subjects that I was dealing with. And I would say something, and somebody would say, yes, but what about that, and what about this? And, and this is how mo many of the ideas in the book came about through these kinds of public conversations. Very so they, they reflect also, to some extent, and, and you know, it's a book about the present. I mean, Sapiens was, is a book about the past and the distant past, and Homo Deus is a, is a book about the future and the distant future. And these things don't, don't necessarily interest most people. I mean, most people don't go about the day thinking about Neanderthals and cyborgs. Uh, and, but 21 Lessons is a book about the present, so it reflects the kind of things that grab people's attention uh, right now in the news or in, in, in conversations. So I want, I'm going to jump now to sort of the, some of the headlines of the book. And, and many would see that uh, not just this book, but kind of your writings over the last uh, these three books, uh, might see a bleak future, a uh, society divided between the ones who've become gods and the ones who are left behind, mm -hmm. lives lacking meaning, probably lacking work, hard-pressed for happiness. Um, is that a fair assessment? Uh, I do tend to focus in my writing more about the negative scenarios. Um, but for, first of all, I don't neglect, I sometimes get the opposite uh, uh, comments also. I write, for example, that we are living in the most peaceful era in history, and I write things like terrorism is mostly a psychological problem, and many more people die from nut allergy than from terrorism. <laughs> you, we should fight the nuts before we are fighting the terrorists. <laughs> like, <laughs> Um, so I do get the opposite, like you're so optimistic, you don't know what's happening in the world. But yes, generally I do tend to focus on the more, more negative scenarios, and this is for, for two main reasons. First of all, um, because so many other people focus on the positive scenarios, especially when we are talking about the technological developments yes, yes. of AI and bioengineering and all that. So it's very obvious and natural that the people who are in the laboratories, in the corporations, uh, who are leading these developments, they naturally focus on all the enormous benefits, and there are enormous benefits, that these technologies can bring us. Uh, so it becomes kind of the job of historians and philosophers and social critics to say, wait a minute, there are also a few negative scenarios or dangerous uh, uh, scenarios. And then the second reason is, as I said before, yes. in order to try and prevent the most negative scenarios. So it's like sounding the alarm. Again, if, if, if nobody else would have been talking about the positive scenarios, then I probably would have been in a position to write a far more balanced uh, story or narrative. Yeah, one thing I was reminded of was, uh, must be about 20 years ago, Bill Joy wrote the cover story in Wired, The Future May Not Need Us. Yeah, exactly. And he was, to me, that was <clears> one <throat> of the, he was a, a heretic in a sense that he <clears throat> was in the technology, you know, world, and he said, but wait a minute, you <clears throat> know, and, and I think what you're saying is, 
uh, yes, Bill, and we <laughs> haven't done enough. <laughs> yes, uh, yeah, we are. Again, it's not a certainty, but uh, 20 years later, it sounds much, much more credible that the future doesn't need most of us. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> you, I'll just say that, you know, it's surprising and a bit sad that one of the most common kind of counter arguments, because I, I talk about these issues quite a lot, and I, maybe the most common counter argument is that we will always be needed as consumers. The economy will fall apart if you don't have all these people to buy things. And, uh, you know, you, you, there are all kinds of counter arguments to that as well. But before we go into the, it, just, you know, from, from a sheer philosophical perspective, the idea that the ultimate destiny of Homo <laughs> sapiens is to be, we are just consumers. That's what we are here for. You know, I, I'm, I'm now reading this book, Why Is There Something Rather Than Nothing? about you know, the biggest questions of all. And no, so far, I, I'm not at the end of the book, but so far in the book, nobody suggested that the ultimate answer <laughs> is to buy stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yes. On that one, I'm, I'm reminded of the movie WALL-E. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, yeah, yeah. and the, the people in their lounge chairs, mm -hmm. unable to move, sort of, drinking, watching. Yeah, just that I, I think that algorithms could also be better consumers than, than humans. Ah. So we are not, even if you accept this scenario, yes, yes. we are not safe. The uh, ultimate. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, the, you, you, you point to, as you say, you name the dangers, and you point to the dangers as, as a warning, as an, you know, to call attention to it. You say that there are three problems three major problems, and one of the things that you comment on, which I'm sure many in the audience noticed, was that these three problems were hardly mentioned in the 2016 presidential election campaign. Yep. Yeah, the three big, big problems of, of humankind as a whole are nuclear war, climate change, and technological disruption. And the third is, of course, the most complicated, because with the first two, we basically know what the aim is, to prevent it. Nuclear war, okay, we need to prevent it. Climate change, we need to, to prevent it. Even the people who deny climate change, they don't say there is climate change, we don't care about it. They say it doesn't, it's not real. But once you acknowledge it's real, then almost everybody reaches the conclusion, yes, we need to, to, to work together to stop it. The third problem of technological disruption is much more complicated because we won't and we shouldn't just stop all technological right. progress. And also, um, it's not clear. When we talk about technological disruption, then AI and bioengineering are the two most important uh, technologies we are talking about. And what scares some people sounds extremely exciting right. to other people. There are not many people who you talk to them about nuclear war, and they say, this is so exciting. <laughs> but <laughs> there are quite a few people that you talk to them about AI becoming more intelligent than humans, and they say, yes, this is very exciting. It's not something to be feared. It's something, actually, uh, uh, that we should accelerate. So this is, this is a much more complicated problem. And these are the three big problems of, of humankind today. They don't receive nearly as much attention in, in the political system, uh, not, in, not just in the US, but, but, but everywhere. And maybe the most important thing to know about all three problems is that they are global in their very essence, and they have absolutely no solution on a national or local basis. There is no national solution to climate change. No government, however powerful, can stop it just by itself or can just build a wall against <laughs> rising temperatures and rising uh, sea levels. And similarly, with, uh, with, uh, with uh, uh, technological disruption, even if we agree what kind of developments we don't want to see, or which kind of regulations should be in place, like we need regulations about uh, doing genetic experiments on human babies. So it's kind of easy to, to, to agree that this, this would be a good idea to have some kind of regulation there. But it should be obvious to anybody who is concerned about genetic engineering that the only way to effectively regulate this technology is through very deep global cooperation. 
Because if just one country right. or several countries bans a particularly dangerous development, but other countries do it, then you don't achieve much. And also the countries with the ban, very quickly they will be tempted yes. to break their own ban because nobody wants to stay behind. If you know that, I don't know, that the Koreans or the Chinese are now producing superhumans by the thousands, you don't want to stay behind. So the only way to really do something about all these three problems is through e effective global cooperation. And I would ask any politician or any voter who talks in terms of my country first and only my country is important and we should just build a wall and the rest of the, of the world can go to hell. Okay, so what's your plan for climate change and nuclear war and technological disruption? How is your country by itself going to solve these problems? Yeah, and obviously it's that, that the other thing you're saying is that the public, the media, everyone doesn't pay nearly enough attention, doesn't have their eyes mm -hmm. on the critical issues, and so you can slide by. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the questions are not raised often enough. Yeah. And in the 2016 election campaign, it was hardly talked about by, by, by either side. Uh, and it's the same way when you look, for example, at the run-up to, to Brexit, Brexit. In, in, yeah. in the UK. There was almost no talk about these issues, even though Britain is one of the leaders of the world, it's, a nu it's one of the, of the nuclear powers, it's uh, one of the five uh, permanent members of the Security Council, and nevertheless, the entire discussion was extremely parochial and ignoring the global problems. And again, it, it should be obvious to everybody that no matter what you think about the merits of Brexit uh, in terms of internal British affairs, on a global level, it should be obvious Brexit doesn't help us at all in preventing nuclear war or climate change, and Brexit doesn't help us at all in regulating artificial intelligence and biotechnology, just the opposite. Uh, the, it's much easier to deal with these issues if you have a strong united European Union than if it breaks up into 20-something in completely independent countries. And of course, it should also be said, there is no longer such thing as really independent countries. It's a complete illusion. It's a, it's a nostalgic fantasy. When you, when you see the world of the 20th, you could be independent in the 19th century, that's true. But there is no such thing as independent countries in the 21st century because no country is ecologically independent. It depends on what other countries do. And similarly, no country is completely technological and scientifically independent because science and technology don't belong to any single country. And uh, developments in one country are bound to have a profound impact on all other countries. If you think that you can just regulate your AI research and that means you're no longer affected by AI research in China or in Israel or in Russia, then you're completely wrong. You know, it's interesting, you're saying these things as obvious, completely wrong. They are obvious. You know, I mean, th these are... <laughs> huh? They are obvious. I know, I know, they are... These, but I'm saying, you're making strong assertions that I agree with. And yet, <laughs> and yet, um, you said in Sapiens that nationalism was on the wane, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, fits with what you were... You know, that would that be sort of a good sign that we're mm -hmm. moving in... So what is happening right now that nationalism is on the rise, mm -hmm. that um, politicians, leaders, whole countries uh, seem to be leaning away from as mm -hmm. if these things are not obvious? Well, I, I don't really know what, what is happening. It's very, very complicated. One perspective is that the political system has uh, failed, and, is, and, and I'm talking about the political system in, in almost all countries, is no longer able to generate meaningful visions for the future. In the 20th century, politics was largely a battle between grand visions mm. about the future of humankind. Some visions were terrible, but they were nevertheless visions about the future. You had basically three big visions, the communist, the fascist, and the liberal vision of the future of humankind, and politics was a struggle between them. What's happening now, and for some time, is that governments and politicians are doing a, quite a good job 
in historical terms, in managing the day-to-day -day affairs of the country. Again, we, we like to complain, but I'm a medievalist by, by like my, my profession originally. I was a specialist in the Middle Ages. So whenever somebody talks about <laughs> the, you know, the education system, or the, the roads, or the healthcare, there was no healthcare in the Middle Ages. <laughs> Nobody even thought that this was part of a job of being a king. You know, when the Black Death came, and a third of the population died, the king had nothing to do with it. I mean, he's the king. I mean, what is he supposed to be about? What is he supposed to do about the Black Death? So when it comes to these things, the political system is doing quite all right in historical perspective. What it has stopped doing is to provide a vision for the future, because it, it is no longer. I mean, the political system hardly even understands what the question is anymore. It hardly understands what are the implications of the new technologies. So it's not a big surprise that they can't provide any, for any meaningful vision for where humankind or the country will be in 2050. And into this vacuum enter the nostalgic fantasies about the past. It's a bit like you, you, you go around the city, you, you're, you're looking for this place, and you drive. And at a certain point, you realize you lost your way. So the first instinct, at least of many people, is go back to the last place you knew where you were. <laughs> and this is what is happening to humankind now on the wow. collective level. We have this very strong and correct sense, yeah. sense yeah. that we no longer know where we are and where we are heading. And then a lot of people have this very strong feeling, OK, let's just go back to the last place we knew where we are. And this is, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, <laughs> and, it, and it, it won't work. When you drive around the city, <laughs> it's a good idea. But in history, you can't go back. And uh, whatever nostalgic fantasies you have about this past or that past, it's not going to give you the solutions to problems like AI or even like climate change. Um, again, you, you, t you see that most of the people who are captivated or, or who are selling these nostalgic fantasies, they just tend to ignore yes. or deny the problems of the 21st century, like climate change or like the rise of AI, because they know at some level that their fantasies don't contain an answer to these questions. Yeah. Um, when you say that, that, for, that these are not national problems, no nation can solve them, it takes global cooperation, yet it looks like global cooperation is on the wane as well. Yes. Uh, do you have some sense of how that's going to turn around? Um, I don't know. <laughs> uh, it's, well, one good piece of information is that we still have far greater cooperation than in almost any previous time in history. If you look at something like, I don't know, I take an example which is non-political. If you look at the uh, football, uh, yes. the, the World Football Cup in, Cup, uh, uh, Cup in Russia a couple of months ago. So this is an amazing example of successful human cooperation, global cooperation. A thousand years ago, the idea <laughs> of bringing people from Argentina, France, and Japan to play games together in Russia would have been completely, you know, <laughs> Out of our, of, um, it's utterly impossible. Nobody even knows in Japan that America exists. Right. And there is no game that everybody plays. And how do you agree on, on the rules? And, and it's absolutely it, impossible. Yeah. And even if you look at the political field, despite all this rise of nationalism and so forth, we are still living in also the most peaceful era in history, comparatively. I come from the Middle East. I know perfectly well there are still wars in some parts of the world, but much less than, than ever before. And if you look at a place like Europe, so despite all of the rise of nationalism, unlike a century ago, Europeans, they like to talk about nationalism. They don't like to die for it, which is a wonderful development. 
you know. <laughs> now, that is a great distinction. Yes. Uh, uh, they'll even, they'll talk about it, they'll vote for they'll it, vote, they'll but, fight over it. But that's it, so far. I don't know what will happen in two years. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but a century ago, in 1918, they were killing each other by the million. Uh, in the last few years, they mostly tend just to talk and vote. And if the vote goes against you, like the Scottish referendum in, in 2014 or something, uh, the, the Scottish nationalists lost the vote, they went to have a pint. <laughs> they did not go to raise a Highlander army and let's go down and burn London. Yeah. No, it doesn't Braveheart, work. Braveheart, yes. yeah. <laughs> so I don't know what will happen, what will happen to, tomorrow in Catalonia, but uh, I hope that they are not going to recreate uh, the Spanish Civil War or the First World War. And again, about the future, we can never be certain. We've climbed very, very high in terms of getting away from the abyss of human violence, but you can fall down very quickly, uh, uh, very fast, I mean, v very far. So we should be very careful, we shouldn't be complacent about it. But so far, as of today, the world is still characterized by far more cooperation and peacefulness than, than ever before. So this is one piece of, of good news. The second piece of good news is that um, there is nothing inherently natural about the kind of nationalism that we are seeing today or that we have seen for the last uh, century or two. And there is nothing inherently impossible in creating uh, global loyalty or global identity. Yeah, you have a, a, there is a lot of people who say that nationalism is in our genes, in our DNA, evolution shaped us uh, to be loyal to a, to a nation, and therefore nationalism is eternal, and also a kind of global identity is absolutely impossible. But th this is just nonsense. Yeah. Uh, humans are social animals, this is absolutely true. But uh, evolution has adapted us to being loyal to a small group that is characterized, above all, by the fact that you know intimately all the other people in your group. We are adapted by millions of years of evolution to be loyal to a hundred other people we know intimately. And this comes naturally to us. Nations are a much, a completely different thing, very strange thing. They are groups of millions, sometimes hundreds of millions of people you never met, you will never meet them, you don't know them at all, and nevertheless you feel loyal to them. There is nothing wrong about it. It brought a lot of good to humanity, this ability to care about strangers, to be loyal to strangers, but it's a very new development. It's based on cultural, and not on evolutionary mm. uh, basis. Um, it's just you know, a couple of centuries or at most a couple of thousand years old. And the most important thing, we can go beyond it. The same mechanisms that enabled Homo sapiens to develop loyalty to a hundred million strangers can also make you loyal to eight billion strangers. That's not leap, such a big difference. That the leap from a hundred to a hundred million is much greater than the leap from 100 million to 8 billion. Exactly, because when you go from 100 to 100 million, you go from 100 you know yeah. to 100 million you don't know. And that's a very, very big leap. How to, be, how to care about somebody I never met and I don't know anything about that person. But we have done, we have made this leap. From 100 million to 8 billion, it's much easier because in both cases, you are dealing with an abstract group of strangers. So yes, this is very difficult, but we've done it with 100 million, so why not 8 billion? So that in fact, nationalism is a good sign that we can do globalism. Yeah, because you know, all, almost <laughs> all the nations yeah. of today, they were formed by bringing together people right. who previously hated each other <laughs> much more yes. than, like, you know, and if you look at Germans, so Prussians and Bavarians really re hated each other. If you look at Britain, so despite all the Brexit and the Scottish referendum and so forth, they are doing quite okay. And again, as a medievalist, I can tell you that the Scots and the English once hated each other and killed each other with as much energy and, the, and the zest as the Israelis and the Palestinians today. 
So if you could get Scots and English to form together the single nation of Britain, there is hope also on other fronts. One thing that, 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 that I was struck by is that you say that one of the things that helped form, for, wait, first of all, I want to say the n- number of times that you go in a historical perspective, I think, <laughs> no, no, I think that is very helpful because mm-hmm. few of us have that, you know, most of our historical perspective is like since high school, you know? Mm. Um, <laughs> uh, but you say that, that, that the event that most perhaps formed your worldview of how to view our situation was the fall of the Soviet Union mm-hmm. and the actions of uh, Gorbachev. Yes. Could you? Yeah, I, I, I was born in 1976, so at least as a child. So you're 13 in 89. Yes. Wow. Uh, and, but I still remember very vividly the Cold War and uh, like the, the, the fear that that's it, the end of the world is coming. And the end of the world didn't come. Instead, uh, we, we had the most peaceful era in history coming. And this, was, this happened not due to any divine intervention. <laughs> uh, God didn't materialize on earth and brought peace. No, it was humans uh, making some, some good decisions, some wise decisions, and really um, coming from some of the most unexpected quarters. I mean, especially, you know, I, Israel was part of the Western Bloc, and uh, I was raised to think that the Soviets are like these, I don't know, I, I, one of my favorite songs still today is Things Russians. I hope the Russians love the, love the, the children too. Which, you know, as a sentence, it's like, like you think they are they're not human even. I mean, you have to hope that they love their children because all these communist zombies, who knows, maybe they don't love their children. And uh, apparently they do love their children. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, because the call, I mean, the, the greatest credit for the peaceful ending of the Cold War goes to the Soviet leadership and to Mikhail Gorbachev. Nobody was in a position to force them. Nobody was in a position to invade the Soviet Union and capture Moscow and force them to, to, to dismantle uh, the communist system. They reached the conclusion that they needed reform and the reform did not really go the way they intended, but when they saw that the system is, is collapsing, they still had the largest conventional army that the world has ever seen. They still had command of enough uh, nuclear weapons to destroy the whole of humankind several times over, and they did not use them. They could have used them, if they gave the order, the Red, the Red Army would have obeyed, and they didn't use them. Um, and, and this is far from self-evident. If you look at somebody like uh, uh, Assad in Syria, or like Gaddafi, or like in 1989, like uh, Ceausescu in Romania, yes, yes. or Milosevic in Serbia, you put a different person in the Kremlin, and you would have gotten a very different result. So it's far from obvious. They, they just chose to admit their failure and make a very, I think, honorable exit from the stage of history. So I'm going to leap from the global to uh, a little bit more personal. You, you make a, a, a very interesting point I found when you said our ability to manipulate often outstrips our mm. ability to understand. And you, he points to nature and says, we learned how to manipulate nature. We dammed rivers, we cut down forests, we did all these things before we understood the web of nature. And you fear that we are about to do the same thing or in the process of Mm -hmm. doing the same thing with human consciousness. Exactly. Uh, Not just consciousness, but the, the entire internal system, the entire internal ecological system inside our bodies, inside our brains, inside our minds. And it's very similar to what happened with the ecosystem outside. When we built these dams and drained the swamps and cut down the forests and so forth, what guided us above all else were economic and political interests. This was the guiding principle about what to do to nature. And it is very likely that when we come to start manipulating and re-engineering our bodies and brains and minds, we will again be guided above all else by immediate economic and political necessities. 
which is a terrible idea to start reshaping. I mean, you know, all previous regimes in history, however dreadful, at least they couldn't really mess up That's right. humanity itself. No matter how dreadful they were, they couldn't really re-engineer the human body and brain. They didn't have the power. They didn't have the power. They didn't have the knowledge. Uh, but now we are acquiring these powers. And to take a, a simple example, that um, in many of these large economic and military and political system, you want people to be able to make faster decisions. For, but compassion, on the other hand, is far less interesting. So one obvious example is that if we, st if we gain the ability to start tweaking the brain, then we are, li we are likely to see people who are able to make much faster decisions and process information much faster at the expense of things like compassion or the expense of things like uh, uh, hesitation. Uh, there is a lot to be said on, on a human level in favor of uncertainty, of hesitation, and things like that. But in, a, a, in an army or in a corporate boardroom, hesitation is not very highly valued. Right, not, not necessarily not valuable, just not valued. Yes. Yeah. It, it can mean, be extremely valuable. As you're but speaking, I'm thinking of you know, rapid uh, speculation, rapid trading. Mm -hmm. That used to, investment decisions used to be something someone thought about <laughs> <laughs> before they invested money in something, and now mm -hmm. an algorithm does it in milliseconds. Yeah, and even if, if if humans try to get involved, so it's more and more likely that the humans will be guided uh, by by algorithms. For example, okay, I want to trade, so I have an algorithm that monitors my brain and knows when I'm making stupid decisions just by past experience. I mean, you can tell quite easily when the human brain has entered a stage in which your decisions are unlikely to be very profitable, and you had better start, stop trading. So even if we keep human traders in the loop, maybe they are forced by some regulation. You have to wear this helmet and the computer is monitoring the state of your... The computer can't still maybe make the decisions, but the computer can tell when your brain has entered the state in which it makes hasty decision, in which you're, let's say, let's say overconfidence. Overconfidence is one of the worst things when you're making snap decisions about millions of dollars. So you, as an investment banker, who has the responsibility to invest billions of investors' dollars, you must wear this helmet, and you're monitored by a computer. And when the computer, by monitoring your brain, realizes uh, that you have entered the zone of overconfidence, you have a red, red light. You sure? Stop trading, or they just cut the power, yeah. whatever. If they don't do it, they may face lawsuits in, you know, in billions. You knew that this person is now overconfident. Why did you let him continue trading with my money? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I would like to talk just a little bit about how we deal with this. Um, what do you think are the things we most need to cultivate, to learn, uh, to educate mm. our young and others and so on, to cope with some of the situations we've, we've mm -hmm. described, some of the, 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 the dangerous situations we are facing? All right, so, so on the collective level, we talked a lot about it. The, the one key ingredient is global cooperation. Whatever you think we should do about these things, it has to be done globally. It can't be done, or it will be very difficult to do it effectively on the level of one nation. If you think about uh, the education system, the most important thing to teach people is, how, is really how to keep a flexible mind and how to keep reinventing themselves throughout their lives, because then we don't know which kind of world uh, young people, the, the, say somebody who enters school today, which kind of world she will inhabit in 2050, we have no idea. So the one thing we do know about this youngster is that she will have to reinvent herself. 
couple of times, not just once, a couple of times during her lifetime. So this is the most important skill or resource which should, which should get the most attention. How do you keep mental flexibility? How do you develop your emotional intelligence so that you can cope with this level of change uh, in your life? On the personal level, I would say maybe the most important thing is, you know, it's the oldest advice in the book, uh, just to get to know yourself better. And this advice is more timely now than it was ever before in history, because for the first time you have serious competition. When Socrates or Buddha told you, know yourself, 2,500 years ago, and you said, eh, I don't have the time, then it wasn't too bad. It, I mean, it was bad, <laughs> but at least, at least nobody uh, could do it for, uh, uh, to you. The Greek police or whatever could not decipher you, could not hack you. So if you fail to know yourself, you are still a black box to the rest of humanity and to the politicians and, and so forth and so on. Now the situation is much more problematic because you have serious competition. Uh, there are many corporations and governments and organizations that are trying constantly to hack you. And if they get to know you better than you know yourself, they can manipulate you. They can sell you anything they want, whether a politician or a product. And all the people who say, no, this can't be because I have free will and I make my decisions freely and nobody could ever decipher me, these are the easiest people to manipulate. <laughs> <laughs> because they, when you manipulate them, it doesn't even occur to them yes. that maybe this desire, no. maybe my amygdala is actually working for Putin. Nah, no way, can't be. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but it can, it can be. So if you want to stay in the game, you have to get to know yourself before and better than these corporations and governments and organizations and so forth. Yeah, that the, the, the algorithms that are manipulating you are racing ahead. Mm -hmm. And many of us are either oblivious or overconfident. Yeah, <laughs> overconfidence is very, very dangerous in, yeah. in, in this situation. And I think, I mean, it's a whole new issue, which probably we don't have much time right. to, to delve into, but the whole issue of free will, which, for, wanted, thousand, yes. which for thousands of years was just this, you know, idle philosophical discussion that maybe you believe in it, maybe you don't, it doesn't have much, much actual implications. Now it has very profound political and, and economic implications. Yeah, one of the things that you say is that Philosophy, history, um, the humanities, in a way, were always nice to do, <laughs> but they were never as urgently needed at a time when students are opting for, I mean, at Harvard, for instance, mm -hmm. which was a bastion of humanities and a laggard in science to some extent. MIT was you know, running rings around it. The biggest major is now engineering and applied sciences. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's what people are going into when what you're saying is to know how to use our power, to yeah. know how we are being used by our power. Exactly. I think that today, to be an engineer for the first time in history, you also need to be a philosopher. Because there are more and more problems in engineering which are actually philosophical problems which have to do a lot with questions like free will, like what is the meaning of life, what is the meaning of humanity, and, 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 and things like that. And also, if let's say that you're, you're, you're writing code, I think it's today extremely irresponsible for any university or college to, have, uh, to give people a degree in computer science if they didn't take at least a few points in philosophy of coding and in ethics of coding. Because writing algorithms, this is what shapes the world today. And you should realize that the algorithms you write, they always have an ethical dimension. I mean, if you write an algorithm that decides who to accept for a job and who not to accept for a job, and these are the kinds of algorithms that are now being written, then you need 
a basis in ethics, in philosophy. Otherwise, you will just program your own philosophical biases and your own ethical prejudices into the algorithm. And we already today have a lot of very unfortunate examples of algorithms supposed to be, you know, mathematically objective, that when you just look a little into them, you realize you have all these racist or, or uh, uh, gendered bias built into the algorithm. And it's not inevitable, but we need to give the coders a basis in ethics and philosophy to prevent it. I'm struck by the fact that we, over the last 10 years or so, began to say MBAs needed to study ethics. Mm -hmm. Do you know? When in fact, that's, that's sort of... Old news. That's old news. <laughs> yeah. It's coders that need to yeah. study ethics I mean, the now. Most, I mean <laughs> if people who study art don't study ethics, eh, that's not You're so right. important. But if the people who are writing the algorithms haven't studied ethics, this is a very, very serious problem. Yeah. You know, I do a lot of interviews, and I very often say, oh, we could just go on <laughs> for hours. But the number of topics, um, and I will just throw one out that I don't think we have time to talk about, which is, you know, that the enlightenment, mm -hmm. the liberal ethic, the first few lines of the Declaration of Independence um, is not adequate yes. anymore. Mm -hmm. So I, I can't just, just speak to that and then we'll go to questions. Yeah, I mean, liberal democracy has been the best system that humans have developed so far in history. How to, how to build a society, how to run a society. But again, we shouldn't be complacent. It should be obvious that like any other system that humans built, it is adapted to particular technological and economic conditions. It would have been impossible to have an American-style liberal democracy in the Middle Ages. You just didn't have the technological and economic basis for that. And similarly, when we look ahead to the future, to the 21st century, democracy as we have known it, over the last few decades will have to change, maybe quite radically, in order to survive. Uh, it's still the best system, I think, especially because it's the most, f it's more flexible system, right, right. but it will have to change. And in a world in which, again, to take the, the, maybe the most important factor, the rise of algorithms that know people better than the people know themselves. This is the, the, the key issue. Now, you, the, our entire system so far, whether you think about democratic elections or whether you think about the free market, it is based on the assumption that nobody knows me better than I know myself. This is why the voter and the customer are the highest authority in the political system and in the economic system. The voter knows best, the customer is always right. Once you have algorithms that know people better than they know myself, it collapses. Because not just you can predict, so you don't need to ask the customer, you can send the product <laughs> ahead, <laughs> but it's, uh, of course, as, as everybody knows, there is a very, very short distance from prediction to manipulation. If you understand the system well enough to predict it, you are usually also in a position to manipulate it. And of course, humans were always manipulated. Right, right. By propaganda, say, it's, it's by a, the it's, government. It's, yeah, it's always been, we always knew the voter could be fooled, the customer could but be was, bamboozled. But it, it, we are reaching a point when there is a difference in, in magnitude in the kind of manipulations you can, you, you, you can have. And if we just leave the system as it is, it will become an emotional puppet show. Once we need to realize that humans are now hackable animals, you can hack them. And if you just leave the basically 18th century system or 19th century system that we, we've inherited without major changes, the result will be an emotional puppet show. Okay. <laughs> Ted, where are you? There we are. Time for a few questions. Um, Yuval, a uh, gentleman asks, uh, Bill Gates has picked two of your books as his summer read recommended books. 
Um, his review in the New York Times recently of this new book had some criticism. Mm -hmm. Could you please respond to that? No, I think criticism is, is a good thing. Uh, this is how science progresses, by having disagreements and, and, and by having debates. Uh, I think the most, Im uh, the most important uh, aim of, of my new book is to focus the conversation <laughs> on certain questions, is to change the global conversation. Let's talk more about AI and climate change and less about things like nationalism and like immigration. And as long as, as people are uh, agreeing on the questions, I'm very happy uh, to have disagreements about, about the predictions and, and about the answers. Um, and I think it's very important to have these, these disagreements because you, the debate has hardly begun. There is hardly yet a serious public debate about, for example, artificial intelligence and big data. So it would be very strange and probably counterproductive if the debate starts by people saying, OK, everybody agrees on the same thing, the end of the, of, of the debate. Um, so this is what I, I think we need to do. And, and in this sense, I was very happy with, with, the Gates, uh, uh, with Bill Gates's review uh, that, great, L let's have this debate. Let's have this disagreement. Uh, next question, um, a gentleman says, if you were asked, and he says this is obviously hypothetical, by members of Congress to help question Mark Zuckerberg and other tech executives in the last month, what sort of questions would you ask them? Ah, what sort of questions? Mm. I would ask about the end game, about where all this is going to. Now, I know that a certainly in a congressional hearing, you're not going to get uh, really honest or complete answers. But as, as, a, as a scholar, as a historian, this is what I would most want to know. What is their vision for, uh, for humanity in terms of decades, 50 years, 60 years, 100 years? Where do they think all this is, is taking us? This is the, the most important question that I would like to get an, an, an answer to. Um, on, on a more immediate level, I would have questions about the basic business model and especially about all, everything that has to do with capturing people's attention. Capturing people's attention and then using it or abusing it in, in, in all kinds of, of, of ways, like selling it to advertisers or selling it uh, to anyone who want, want, wants to buy it. And I think that human attention is, has always been an extremely important resource. And now, because of the intense competition, it becomes maybe one of the most important resources. And how to defend human attention from being abused. Now, you have, and this goes back to the question about the current system and the free market and democracy. The standard answer is humans have free will. The customer is always right. If the customer wants to play Candy Crush five hours a day, the customer is always right. But Candy Crush and, and the things like it were designed to hack our brain. I think that these kinds of answers, the customer is always right, they have free will, nobody should play Big Brother and tell them what to do and, and, and so forth. This is no longer an acceptable answer in the 21st century. Again, this is one of the prices to pay for the naive belief in free will that gives, this gives an open check to abuse, people attention, to, the, to abuse the attention of people, and then the reply is always, okay, people chose it, they have free will. Uh, could you please describe your spiritual practice? Uh, does your practice help? <laughs> See, I stayed away from that one. Uh, <laughs> Does your uh, spiritual practice help you deal with or accept the current state of the world? And lastly, do you believe spirituality taps into an objective truth or is it just a personal deception mm -hmm. that allows the individual to feel a false sense of calm and connection? Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, so uh, maybe I'll, I'll start by def my definition of spirituality. 
I distinguish between spirituality and religion. Spirituality is about questions and religion is about answers. Spirituality is when you have some big question, like who am I or, or what, what is reality or what is the good? And you are willing to follow this question wherever it takes you, even if it takes you into conflict with all kinds of established traditions and authorities and so forth. This is the spiritual quest. Religion in many cases is exactly the opposite, is coming with an answer, with a story, this is the answer, and if you dare to doubt it, then you will burn in hell or we will burn you. <laughs> and in this sense, they are opposites. Um, for me, the big spiritual question that I follow is what is reality, what is really happening? And uh, I don't want to go too much into my, my practice, not just because it's private, but mainly because it's um, one of these things that it, it, it doesn't do a lot of good uh, uh, to talk about them too much. But um, my, I, I practice Vipassana meditation. I do two hours every day when I get the opportunity. I go every year for a long retreat of between 30 and 60 days. And the one question that guides the, the practice is what is really happening right now? What is reality? And it starts with, and you think, okay, what is reality? You think about the global system and about the elections in the US and about the capitalist system. No, you need to start with, with the simplest things. So it, it starts with just, ob just observing the breath coming in and out of your nostrils. When I went to my first meditation course, the, the teacher, Goenka, just gave this instruction, you bring all your attention to the breath, and when the breath goes into your nostrils, you just know, oh, now it goes into the nostrils. <laughs> and when it goes out, you just know, now it goes out. That's, that's it. It's not, you don't even need to control the breath. You, it's not a breathing exercise. You just try to see reality as it is, and it sounded like the, like, you know, the simplest, most ridiculous thing in the world. What can I learn by that? And the amazing thing for me was, I was doing my PhD at Oxford at the, at the time, and so I thought I was a very clever person, <laughs> and <laughs> I couldn't do it for more than 10 seconds without my mind running away somewhere. Like, I would try to just, okay, no, is it coming in or out? And I would, my mind would run away to some memory, some fantasy, some, some whatever. And I realized I have, absolutely no control of my mind. I know almost nothing about my mind. And between me and the world, the mind constantly generates all these stories and fictions and fantasies and whatever. And they constantly come between me and the world, not just between me and the capitalist system. They come between me and my breath. If I can't <laughs> observe my breath for more than 10 seconds, just as it is, what hope do I have of observing correctly the intricacies of Wall Street or whatever. <laughs> uh, so this was one of the, the, the first big realization that, that, that I had. And uh, uh, in a way, my, my spiritual quest started uh, from that. Can I uh, give him a last question? Why don't you take the last question? I'll give you a last question because it's one thing we left out. Okay. Um, you began to touch on it in the meditation when you were talking about meditation. You say that one of the most important things in your life, in your work, for all of us, is to separate reality from fiction. Leave us with a mm. few words on that one. Well, it's very difficult for humans to do it because we conquered the world through telling fictional stories. So it's really a kind of matter of survival for us not to be able to tell the difference <laughs> between fiction and reality. Um, but from a moral perspective, and this may, may be a kind of answer, um, it's extremely important to be able to separate what is a fiction invented by humans and what is the reality. Now, fictions are extremely important. We can't uh, organize any large-scale corporation without <laughs> fictions without things that we invent and exist only in the stories we tell. And if earlier I, I gave the example of the World Football Cup, 
So you can't play football mm. unless you get 22 people, at least 22 people, to agree on the same fictional set of rules that we invented. Uh, and it's fun to play football, it's fun to watch football, it's, it's, it, it is good it's there. But uh, when some people lose, uh, 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 miss the difference between fiction and reality, they might start beating and killing people <laughs> because their team lost the game or something like that. And that's a, that's a bad idea. <laughs> and they should remember, oh, okay, it's just a game. And it's true also of things like gods and religion and, and money and nations. nations and corporations. We invented them. They are there to serve us. We invented nations and money and corporations and all that in order to organize ourselves and in order to improve life for ourselves. If we discover that we are starting to sacrifice people for these imaginary entities, something went wrong somewhere. And so it's very important to be able to tell the difference between a real entity and a fictional entity. Now, the best and simplest test yes. is the test of suffering. If you want to know whether the hero of some story that people tell you about life is real or fictional, you should just ask, can it suffer? Now, a nation cannot suffer. Even if it loses a war, and you say the nation suffered a huge defeat, this is just a metaphor. It didn't really suffer. It doesn't have a mind, it doesn't have consciousness, it, it can't feel pain or sadness or depression, nothing. Germany wasn't depressed after the First World War. Some Germans, many Germans were, but not Germany, it doesn't have a mind, it can't be depressed. And similarly, a corporation, can't feel anything, it can't experience suffering, and a currency can't experience anything. Humans, on the other hand, and also other animals, they are real entities. They can suffer. So, um, very counterintuitive, but a chicken can suffer far more fr than the United States, or than uh, Google, because a chicken has a mind, and it can experience pain and pleasure and all kinds of other sensations and emotions. And it would be good for, for everybody, I mean, you can't do it all the time, but to keep returning to this very simple basic test to know what is the difference between reality and fiction, simply the question, can it suffer? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>